Today, and you know, I, I, I could probably speak forever on this. I don't have like a huge long sermon mapped out, but I just want to talk about this idea of suffering and the fight of faith. You know, and it's almost the verses, suffering versus fighting for faith. Because it's popular within Christianity to accept a lower standard of life than what God wants for you and call it humility or holiness or whatever, right? In other words, what I mean is it's, you know, because Jesus, because Paul does say things like, well, I'm content in everything. And we know that Paul, the missionary Paul that took the gospel out more than most, uh, experienced great tragedy. And so from Paul's life, it kind of sounds like, well, we should just embrace every hardship that happens, you know, every difficulty that we go through, somehow as part of God's overarching master plan. So whatever situation we find ourselves in, after all, God's in control. And I say that in air quotes. Everything that happens is everything for a reason. He's going to work out all things good, and he works in mysterious ways, and we just don't understand his will, and his ways are higher than our ways. And you get this mixed bag of baloney, junk, garbage theology. But isn't that what most people believe? They just say those things as if it's true when the reality is, no. There, there are times where suffering might need to be embraced, but there are other times where you need to fight the fight of faith. And it's very clear when those should happen. You want to know? Yeah. We talk about it in here pretty regularly. Uh, the only kind of suffering that God endorses is the persecution of faith. Suffering for righteousness sake. And what I mean by that is, like Paul, like the apostles, you might be called to go into a particular area that is hostile to the gospel and you experience persecution, maybe even to the loss of life for the sake of the gospel. Amen. Suffering for suffering's sake is not God's plan. Are you with me? So there's suffering for Jesus' sake, but suffering for suffering's sake is not part of God's plan. There's kind of this mindset that any difficulty, any tragedy, any loss, any lack, any depression, any anxiety, any confusion, any hardship that you find yourself in, you should just embrace it, remain faithful in the midst of it because it's part of God's plan and He's going to work it out for your good and you should just suffer and, and persevere and learn patience. Amen. That's what's said and it's not true. I want to be very clear. <laughs> it's not true. Not every, not every kind of suffering that you experience should be embraced. In fact, some suffering that we find ourselves in should be fought. Depression, Amen. disease, confusion, anxiety. Are you with me? The things that Jesus paid for on the cross are yours now. If Jesus, if in his body on that cross he suffered it, he suffered it for you. In other words, you don't have to endure it. You can fight to see that promise manifest in your life. Now, we don't always see the promises manifest in our life because we're involved, right? We have to believe and receive. And I'm not saying you got to work it up with your faith. You're not trying to convince God to give it to you. You're just hosting it in your mind and in your heart to the degree that it becomes your reality greater than whatever it is that is opposing what he's promised. It's a spiritual aspect. It's, a, it's, it's seed time and harvest. It's just sit. In fact, here's the reality. Nobody can really teach you how to receive the promises. You must perceive it on your own. You must interact with the Holy Spirit on your own. I feel like when you talk about these kinds of subject matters, you can paint a picture and, and you know, I might be a master wordsmith and can paint a picture that you're looking at and you're going, well, I see it, it's pretty clear. You know, I, I get the picture, but you haven't had an emotional connection with it yourself. You haven't had that intimate aspect where you're grabbing a hold of what Jesus has provided for you. And that might be because of the bruising in your heart. Doesn't mean you gotta get more holy, doesn't mean you gotta quit sinning to get it fundamentally. Now, you might need to quit sinning to receive it, but not because God's withholding it from you because you're in sin, but because sin robs your confidence toward Him. 
What sin does is it hardens your heart. Sin locks you into this realm of guilt and shame where you don't think that you're worthy to receive the things that Jesus paid for. That's why you should stay out of sin because it's hardening your heart toward God. But if you, you know, like Paul, don't sin. But if you do, remember, Jesus already paid for it. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding that you experience everything that he paid for. Now, some people will hear that and say, well, then you're kind of just excusing sin. Well, if that's what you hear, then you know what? Go pray, because that's not what I'm saying. Sin kills, destroys, avoid it at all costs. Grace is not a license to sin. It's not the open door to sin. But it does mean God's not interacting with you based on your sin any longer. Now, if you hear that, if you hear God's not relating to me based on my sin, and then you think that means, well, then I can just go sin. Well, I know what's in your heart. You're just itching to do it. You're, you're a legalistic twit that is only behaving properly because you think God's going to strike you dead if you don't. That's a theological term, twit. In the Greek, it means dummy. So the suffering thing, right? Because we, we, so there's things that we experience or don't experience, and then, then we watch other people, right? And we know that we have the power. We have power within us to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Do we not? How many of you have seen a miracle happen in your life personally, or you've prayed for someone and you've seen a miracle happen? Yeah. And we're not just talking about miracles. By the way, a miracle is not when something impossible happens. A miracle is when a higher law that supersedes natural law takes effect and affects our current realm. Because the higher law, is, it's true in a reality in that place, and it informs this realm of how it should be, Amen. and it responds accordingly. Amen? So it's not you're doing something that's impossible, because it is impossible to remove a cancerous tumor with speaking to it. But in that realm of spirit, God created through speaking. And so you can't look at spiritual uh, truth and then try to bring it down into carnality to make it work. In other words, you can't in your own mind think, I'm going to force this thing. Go, 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 as if it's you know, this kind of effect that you're trying to have on it. You have to stay in that realm in the mindset of spirit to believe, no, this is already paid for. I don't know how, and, and Jesus talks about it in Mark 4 of how it, that part works. He says, I don't know how it works, but it's like, a, it's like a farmer that casts seed in the ground. He goes to sleep and he wakes up and the kingdom and the word just does what it does. It takes effect, amen? amen. And nobody can really explain that to you. <laughs> Do y'all remember a few weeks ago that it was like, I said something, the spirit of God is here. And that phone went, hallelujah. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> hey, you remember when? <laughs> Am I good, Courtney? We got, a, we got a new toy back there so I can actually move. I'm untethered now. Um, so you can follow me. So, you know, this idea of suffering versus fighting for the faith. Let me go through, through a few passages, kind of a few statements here. Not all suffering should be embraced. The only suffering God endorses is the persecution of your faith. Amen? Amen? And there's a difference between suffering for Jesus' sake and suffering for suffering's sake. Yeah. Don't accept every negative situation as the will of God. God made us promises for a good quality of life and desires that were healthy and prosperous. I mean, we just kind of have to have some absolutes in our faith and, and, and trust that this is what he wants. You look in the garden, it's the way it was. You look in heaven, it's the way it is. You look at Jesus and he showed us in the midst of it, everything else is a disruption of what God wants. 
You know, you don't see in Scripture. You're never taught to embrace depression or sickness or confusion or loss or tragedy. But you do see Paul instructing people to embrace persecution. Because of, it brings glory to God. Not the fact that you're being persecuted, but the fact that you're somewhere that is hostile to the gospel, that's hearing the gospel. That's what brings glory to God. And the fact that you remain faithful in that and you keep your faith toward the Lord. You know, there, I've heard of stories where people are in the midst of persecution, Christians being killed, and then afterward people that are part of the you know, execution team give their heart to the Lord because of the faith that they've seen, you know. What a glorious opportunity that is. So are you with me? So the distinction is you get called somewhere, you experience persecution in that area, you are imprisoned, beaten, whipped, stoned, boiled, tarred, feathered, killed. Praise the living God. Glory to His name because you've been able to give your life in service to Him. That kind of suffering you might experience. Now, I'm not saying go and pray for it. You know, there's this kind of false humility mindset in Christianity that thinks, well, we need to be experiencing difficulties to stay humble and holy so that we don't make God upset with us, you know. Baloney. So those things you might experience persecution, but if you find yourself sitting at the bedside of someone that's dying that you love, that's not the kind of persecution we are, that's not the type of suffering that we are to embrace. We are to fight in those moments. Sometimes, it, it, sometimes we see the promise and sometimes we don't. You guys all know we're, we're coming up and this month is the month that my mom passed, almost two years ago. And Cheryl, two years. January be three. January be three. Right. And, and, and we're grieving. <coughs> Man, it hits me. You know, we're grieving with Elizabeth's family who just lost someone. And, and we could go into those and, and we can stay there. And there is a proper grieving time. But that's not the kind of suffering we are to embrace. The, the loss of a marriage, the loss of a child, the loss of a job. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of heavy at the moment, but I'm just saying even the loss of a tire. And I use that example a lot because I have heard of people that get flat tires and they wonder why God let it happen. What lesson are they supposed to learn because of that flat tire? I mean, we laugh, but it's true. You know, we stub our toe that morning and we lose the nail. God, why are you doing this to me? What's, what am I supposed to learn in this? And, and so we think, okay, well, I'm just going to embrace it because it's all part of his plan. No, that, that's not. God didn't sit down and map out of, you know, 6,000 years in the future, Peter's going to stub his toe and here's the lesson that I want him to learn. That, that's just not what he's doing. I mean, the reason you might have a flat tire is because you didn't change the tires. <laughs> now, well, let me, let me just keep going here. Not all suffering should be embraced. Because these are the kinds of things that get talked about that confuse us. And, you know, so I do want to address them. This is Romans 5, 3 through 5. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Now, again, if you take the time to go through the entire New Testament and you look at every single word where suffering, suffer is mentioned, trial, tribulation, difficulty, hardship, all of that, you start to see that there's two different categories. The suffering that he talks about that he willingly embraces is always related to persecution of the faith. The trials and difficulties might just be hardships in life that are, are testing your faith. It's not God crafting the test. You know, I've got this whole thing where I go through James and down into James 1.13, it says, you know, when, the, when the tribulation happens, don't say it's from God. Yet we see in sufferings related to persecution, it specifically says this might be God's will for your life. So in one hand, you've got temptation and tribulation. Don't say it's from God. Persecution, even to the loss of life, is the will of God for your life. Well, 
You can't mix all that stuff up together and say, well, sometimes he wants you to suffer and sometimes he doesn't. Are you with me? I want to draw a clear distinction between when you should embrace suffering and when you shouldn't. Most of our lives, there's never a time that we should embrace suffering because we're probably not experiencing persecution. I mean, we might get a mean post on Facebook, but I mean, come on. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Specifically related to persecution of the faith we see, 1 Peter 4.14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. You ever been insulted for the name of Christ? I have. I mean, most of us experience, have experienced that type of issue. Um, but it doesn't say if you contract cancer, you're blessed. All right? Now, I'm not just reading into Scripture. I say that from the context of there's not anywhere in Scripture, in the New Testament, in the, in the teachings of Jesus, or in the New Testament ever that, that equates embracing suffering related to a lot of what Christianity attributes to the will of God. Are you with me? Indeed, none of you should suffer. So watch this. He actually makes the distinction here. None of you should suffer as a murderer or thief or wrongdoer or even as a meddler. You ever suffered as a meddler? <laughs> Think about it. So he draws the distinction here and he says, I don't want you suffering because of this kind of stuff. Do you see it? You're not in trouble. You can keep laughing. It's all right. That was funny. I looked at Hans, and he was laughing. All of a sudden, he went. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, think about that. You ever meddled in places you weren't supposed to be, and it just like, <laughs> you were, oh, man, let me keep going. <laughs> so he draws the distinction. Don't suffer for these things. You're not, you know, I'm not, I'm not wanting you to suffer for suffering's sake. But, but if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but glorify God that you bear that name. You see, there's a difference. Some suffering he embraces, some he doesn't. I would add in that list, and I'm not trying to be blasphemous saying the Bible is, it lacks. I'm just saying in principle, you could add to that list. No one should suffer the things that Jesus paid for you to be delivered from. What did he pay for you to be delivered from? The power of darkness, the power of sin, the power of death, disease, sorrows, sickness, depression, anxiety. He died for you to be delivered from those things. Works righteousness, delivered from the law, he died that you would be delivered from those things. So at the end of 15, I would add uh, also, so don't suffer. None of you should suffer the things that Jesus has delivered you from. Is that legal? Can we say that? Yeah. All right. But if, if as a Christian, you might suffer. So... Philippians 1.29, For you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Suffer for His sake, not suffer for suffering's sake. In Christianity, it's very popular to teach any situation that you find yourself in suffering, embrace it because it's going to teach you patience. Do you hear me? That's suffering for suffering's sake. It's as if suffering is the teacher. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Amen. Honestly, if you're learning patience from suffering things that are in that list that he says he don't want you suffering from, you know what that's called? Foolishness. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if you're just one of those people that says, well, I need to learn the hard way, you are a fool. And me too. And I take that from Proverbs and it says, the wise learn from instruction, but the fool doesn't pay to attention to instruction and proceeds into destruction. So I'm a fool too at times. 
Anytime that we see biblical wisdom and we don't put it into practice and we live a life contrary to it and we experience difficulty, we're foolish. But you can learn from instruction and avoid it in the first place. Now, am I saying that your life should just be perfect and peaches and cream and all that? Well, in relation to the things that Jesus paid for you to experience, you have the legal right to experience everything that Jesus paid for you to have. But if you find yourself in a situation where you're called to an area where you are brutalized and tortured, praise be to the glory of God. Are you with me? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it as clear as I possibly can because of the entrenchment of the doctrine into our brains about this idea of just embrace every difficulty and remain patient in it because if you remain patient in whatever difficulty you find yourself in, then you're going to bring glory to God. And it's like, uh, you just got to, we need to nuance that and sort through it and make it more clear rather than just being, having this weird cloud of con cliches, right? Because we don't want cliche Christianity. We want new covenant, finished work, power of God Christianity. Amen? So, for example, let me just kind of give you a, a few passages here. In the area, so when do you embrace suffering and when do you fight for the promises? It's, again, related to if Jesus paid for it. Now, let me just walk you through a few different passages here in the area of healing. It's interesting, you know, I just believe the Holy Spirit wanted to minister healing this morning. And I pray that you engaged in that. And I pray that it strengthens you and empowers you. I know when my mom passed and other people that we loved, and you know, it's difficult because you take that bruising. I mean, you sit there and you pray for them. And you know the truth. You know what Jesus paid for, but you don't see it happen. I, I was thinking about this. Can I, let me just say this. You know, there's two times where Jesus addresses why healing didn't happen. One is the disciples couldn't get the young boy healed. They come back to Jesus and they say, we couldn't do it. Jesus heals them. They ask Jesus, why couldn't we do it? And he says, your unbelief. This kind of unbelief only comes out by prayer and fasting. So you need to go deal with your heart, get that unbelief out of your heart. Why couldn't we heal the boy? We had unbelief in our heart. There's another time where Jesus is addressed. Now see, to build a doctrine, a theological doctrine, you have to take, take what the scripture says at face value. Are you with me? So you can't just make up doctrine based on someone else's circumstances. So the doctrine of why healing doesn't happen is built from when Jesus himself, God himself addresses it. Are you with me? So in other words, if you're going to believe something about anything, if Jesus specifically addresses it, that must be what you believe about it. Are you with me? Now, that might be revolutionary, not for y'all, for some Christians, but it's just true. If Jesus specifically addressed it, that's what we're to believe about it. And there's two areas where he directly addressed, I prayed, it didn't happen. One, the unbelief of the prayer. Two was when he went to his hometown and it says that he could not do many miracles because they did not honor him as the prophet. In other words, if you don't believe in Jesus, think about it. Most of the times that Jesus performed a miracle, he would ask people, do you believe that I can do this? And they'd say, yeah, I just saw you heal that guy. I think you can do it, you know. But he was gauging where their heart was. Do you believe that I can do this? In my mind, I play that out. And I see him in his hometown wanting to heal people, asking them, do you believe that I can do this? And they say, you're the carpenter's son. I used to wipe your butt when you were a kid. <laughs> He's in his hometown. People know him. I imagine this. Jesus knows a lot of these people. He knows some of those people that are suffering and dying, and maybe even dying while he's trying to pray for them. I see Jesus. Now, there's two different ways to read that. One, it says he could not do many miracles. Some people hear that and say he would not do many miracles because they didn't respect him. In other words, he showed up in town. I'm the prophet. I'm here to heal you. And they were like, no, you're not. And he said, well, fine, then I'm not going to do it. That's kind of how some people believe it. 
Or it's he showed up in his hometown, he wanted to display who he was, he was moving about, doing all the things that he'd done every other area, and they were like, I don't think so, Jesus. I know you. You're telling me you're the Messiah? You're the Son of God? I don't think so. That person couldn't receive from him. I see him wanting to pray for sick and dying people that he loves, that he grew up with, that he knows, that knows his family, that knows his brothers and sisters, maybe even the friends of his brothers and sisters, and people that he's emotionally connected with in his hometown. This is his hometown, right? Build that picture in your mind. He's there, Jesus, God in the flesh, wanting to pray for people who did not respect and recognize who he was and he couldn't heal them. Now that'll mess with your doctrine, but that's what it says. Jesus knows what it feels like to pray for people that you love and they don't receive it. He's been there. However, this is the will of God. He paid for it. We prophesied. Uh, Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before. Isaiah 53, 4. However, it, is our, it was our sickness that he himself bore. I mean, can you imagine? Like, we wrestle with this stuff. But here's Jesus, who can't heal some people in his hometown, knows this passage, knows what he's going to do for them. He himself is going to die for this person and take their disease and sickness and they won't receive it from him. I, I know, I know. You know, it's like there are people signing off of YouTube right now. I can hear them. I'm, the messages are coming. I hear them. I get it. However, it was our sicknesses that he bore and our pains that he carried. Are you in pain? He carried it. Yet we ourselves assumed that he'd been afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated, but he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Spirit, soul, and body. Let me just keep going. You've been called to this purpose. I read that out of order. We're going to stick on the healing one. Romans 8.10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So, so here's, here's what I'm doing now. Drew a line, what kind of suffering you should embrace, what kind you shouldn't. When you're in a situation where you need to fight the fight of faith and fight against that suffering that you're in, in other words, you're fighting to experience something that Jesus paid for, what do you do? We're specifically looking at the area of healing because Jesus addressed it on the cross. There are other areas. So I'm showing you a few scriptures of how to fight the fight of faith in the area of healing. You can do it in the area of depression, anxiety, poverty, a lot of the things that we are told to embrace to be good Christians. Are you with me? We're just looking in one area. This is what I want to do. When I'm suffering something that I know that Jesus paid for me to experience a different quality of life, I'm going to the Scripture. I'm going to build, some, I'm going to build a confession uh, script for myself, not to try to convince God to do something. He's already done it. But to get my mind and my heart in alignment with who he is and what he's done to get that doubt and unbelief out of my heart. Because it's my unbelief that's keeping me from experiencing that which he's already given me. It's not him withholding it. So in the area of healing, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to passages like this. Are you with me? If Christ is in you, is Christ in you? Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you... He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal or your physical body through His Spirit who dwells in you. There is a very popular 
realm of Christianity out there that gets and understands the finished work, but they say that the healing that's available is for your spirit and for your soul, not for your body. Do I not need to move? I see cameras moving. We good? I see no thumbs. There, Y'all are ignoring me back there. I'll stay put. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So, what are you going to do? you got an area that you're suffering, and you're wondering, is this God's will for my life? Well, you know. Is it persecution for the faith? Or is it from your meddling? He, that's what he said. Like, I, don't want, I don't want you suffering from your meddling. So then we're left with this. I'll finish with this. 2 Peter 1, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord and of Jesus our Lord. So let me just take it one verse at a time. Grace and peace. So peace, we are at one with the Father. We have been given a covenant of peace, an eternal, everlasting covenant of peace that is secure in the blood of Christ. The Father and the Son have an eternal agreement together. You are in the Son, so you are in that agreement. Amen? You are at one. That's what peace means. You have been made whole. The relationship has been restored. You've been made whole with the Father. You're at peace. We're not just talking about a positive, feel-good emotion, which is what this message gets accused of a lot, that they don't get it. The peace is I rest in the wholeness of the relationship that I have with the Father because I am in the Son. I am at peace with the Father. Praise God. I rest in that. And grace is that divine influence in our heart that gives us capacity and strength and power, right? Grace is not just mercy or undeserved favor. Grace is a supernatural spiritual strength that rises up inside of you when you need it. It's what gives you the power to fight the fight of faith. Amen? Now, he wants all of that multiplied to you. How is it multiplied to you? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Knowledge is not just informational, it's experiential. This particular word here for knowledge is, I'm experiencing this peace and this grace. It's not, I just, it's just, it's not that I know about it. Because, I mean, that, that's why a lot of Christians become denominationalists and cessationists. In other words, meaning... Well, the, you know, I don't really see the miracles happening much today, so I don't kind of, I don't think they're for today. I'm not experiencing, I don't see very many people experiencing it. I don't see very many people experiencing a lot of the stuff that Jesus did back then. So uh, my information concludes, my, anal my analysis concludes it's not for today. But we need to experience Him and what He suffered and accomplished for us. So... Grace and peace are multiplied to you as you experience this relationship. So, as His divine power, to me that's just another word for grace. His divine power in me has given to us all things, say all things, that pertain to life and godliness. You know, He gave you things that pertain to life, not death. Uh, <clears throat> through the experiential knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which He has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This is what God wants for you. He has made you great and precious promises so that you would be a partaker of His divine nature. Well, I don't see that in my life. Well... Are you going to live in this realm of confusion toward the Lord? Or are you going to take the word at the word, you know, at face value? Did he pay for it or not? And I, and I know, I, listen, I know how hard that is. I know how challenging that is. And I know how humbling it is. But God deserves for us to just believe what he said. There's another point, and I'll end on this. These great and precious promises that He's made to us, things like 
I mean, really, they're just, char- they're just attributes of his character. Provision, you know, God is the Lord God, our provider. The Lord God, our healer. He is our great counselor. You know, he's our teacher. All of those things. All of those aspects of the character of God are, is what he promised to us. Now, here's the thing about promises within a covenant. If I cut a covenant with someone, if I come into an agreement, each party brings benefits and promises to sweeten the pot, so to speak. In other words, if I'm going to cut covenant with you, this is what I bring. What do you bring? Why should I stay in this? I have, and so there are promises that are made. And if in that covenant I break my promises, in other words, I say to you, I will heal you as part of my end of the bargain, and I don't, you can get out. And my word, my character is tarnished. God has made great and precious promises. Those promises are the things that Jesus paid for. So the promises of God are not just wishes that a charismatic can try to believe and pray for. They are covenantal extensions of God assuring the relationship that He has with His Son that you are part of. So if God were to go back on any of these promises that He's made, He, I mean, everything would fall apart. He would not be a man of His Word. The character and the integrity of His Word, which, by the way, upholds everything, would fail. But here's the thing. You've got to know what He paid for. And he paid for it for you. And so if the other person doesn't receive it, you can't hold that against God. I'm just saying, because I hear some of y'all's thoughts and you're like, well, he didn't keep the promise here. Well, come on. You know what I'm talking about. So, suffering for Jesus' sake or suffering for suffering's sake. And if you find yourself suffering for meddling, or suffering the things that Jesus paid for you to not have to suffer, you got to make a decision. Which, which, what are you going to do? Are you going to, are you going to stop? And I get it. There's a period. There's a grieving period. There's a, there's a reshaping, a rebuilding period. And you know, there's a working on your heart period. There's a forgiveness period. There's all of the stages of all of that. I get it. I understand. I want to be real about life. You know, I don't want to just paint this picture. Bless God. We should just be. Healing, wow! You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, but I'm living my life over here, man. Just come on, give me a break. Because I see it on some of the faces, and I, and I hear it and things I've been through, and I know the things that y'all are going through. <clears throat> but God does too. He's been there. He's been through it. He knows. He has, in all ways, he's been tempted like we are yet without sin. He is a high priest that is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. God has been divorced. He divorced Israel. He knows the pain of it. He has lost people. He has seen rebellion against them. He's seen all this. Everything that we experience, he's experienced. And he remains steadfast in who he is. And he's extending to you these promises to be a partaker of his divine nature. Amen? Amen. Now, we can become offended at these kinds of messages. And I get it. And and sometimes you sideline yourself, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you if you just kind of chill for a bit. It's all right. But don't let yourself stay there. Amen? Amen. Don't, 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 Don't let what you believe about who God really is become long-term affected by circumstances, yours or someone else's. Amen? Because the world needs to see a believing church experiencing the promises of God, not just because we're charismatics and we believe and receive it, but because we are in this family that God wants to take care of His children. I want Jesus to get what He paid for. You know, if your parents, you look at your family, if there's unhealth in the children, you don't want that. You want them to be healthy and whole and experiencing everything that life has to give them. God's the same way. That's just what He wants. He just wants His children to have a healthy quality of life. Amen? 
It's just what he wants. Did you have, you were pointing at yourself, you got something, Donald? <clears throat> Come on over here with me. No, I did. Uh, was on. He, he, he'll get it. Hello. You got him. You got me? So no, everything Clint has said is so true. Uh, I'm not up here to say, woe is me. I lost my mother. 17, lost Cheryl after 47 years. Uh, January will be three years. But I had such a peace. It's unexplainable. I mean, I had a peace. And that all happened right here. I remember, I don't know if it was Jesus, angels, or what. The light was so bright that I couldn't see, couldn't see the head. But ever since then, I have had such a peace in my heart. Not here, but in my heart. And anybody in here, including you, I released a peace that Jesus gave me. Yeah, thank you, Lord. And every one of you that has lost loved ones, someone that's close to you. Thank you, Lord. So I released that peace on all of you. And uh, I'm happy. Thank you, I'm Lord. very happy. Yeah. Another thing. My wife always told me, we talked about, I'm sure y'all talk about, if who goes first, who's going to get married first? Cheryl said, you'll be married in less than six months. I'm, no, never. <laughs> she, knew, she, she, <laughs> she knew <was> you. Right. <laughs> so I'm happily married now. I got married very quick to a woman I didn't even know. She was definitely sent by God. And Cheryl knew it was going to happen. Yes. And about the healing, unbelief, you know, I could get myself in trouble. <laughs> but if the room's full of it, it's not going to happen. Hmm. What? If the room if the is full room of unbelief, full, there's a reason Jesus kicked people out of the room when he wanted to pray for people. Yeah, like at the hospital. Go better come. You better come on. That's unbelief. I mean, that can't, that, that don't work. So, anyway. Yeah. I've been wanting to say this to all y'all for a while. Yeah, well, that's the God good, is it's a good, good day for it. He is good. Amen. His word is true. Amen. 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 Thank you. I appreciate it. Chris, you want to just kind of play us out? <clears throat> Let's just stand up, put our attention on the Lord. And, you know, because these are, this is not easy. This is, this is you know, this is kind of like full-grown Christian adult stuff here. We're either going to deal with these issues or we're not. We're either going to have a cliche Christianity or we're going to have a Christianity that's based on the Word of God, based on what Jesus paid for. Amen? Amen. We're either going to be honest with ourselves about this stuff or we're going to, Stay in the realm of confusion. Now, that doesn't mean you got to fast track where you are and just act like everything's fine because that's not the way it works either. I don't want you to do that. The Lord doesn't want you to do that. <clears throat> but, but do move forward, you know, not to appropriate our name per se, but there is a reason that I feel like God gave us this name and it is to be that constant reminder to just keep moving forward. Don't wear yourself out. Don't beat yourself up. Don't outrun your heart. You know what I mean? Don't outrun where you are in your heart. Be honest. Reflect. Be, tr be, just be self-aware. But build your hope and your expectation on the Word, specifically what He paid for. Because as you do, He's glorified. And then you become that witness and that testimony for others to see, to, to watch Donald, who probably had all types of judgment cast toward him but his wife of 47 years knew he'd be married within six months that's powerful that she would even say that man that's healing and not to major on just that but man so father we just thank you we give you our hearts thank you that you're continuing to minister to those areas Glenn, if, you wouldn't, if you'd come forward, anybody else on the prayer team here, if you'd come forward and just be ready. If anybody needs prayer for anything further today as we close, just make your way up. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Some of you, you, know, some of you are here. Uh, you heard some of us praying in the Spirit, speaking in an unknown language, praying in tongues, if you want to call it. If you don't do that and you'd like to, make your way up here, see one of these guys, they'll walk you through that process. It's already yours. You don't lack anything. You're not going to get something you don't already have. You're just going to wake up what's already in you. Amen? Father, we thank you. 
Father, we thank you specifically as we shift our focus. We thank you that you are our provider. From the beginning of time, you have sought to have a holy nation of priests that you could bless, that could be a blessing to the nations of the world. So, Father, we let go of our mindset of, of our jobs being our provider, of anything being our provider. You are my provider. Just tell him that. Say, you are my provider. And just embrace this. He desires to provide for you better than you can imagine. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think, God desires to bless you so that you would be a blessing. Just embrace the concept that you will be a blessing. <clears throat> Teach yourself, discipline yourself to be generous with your finances. You know, God is not waiting to rebuke the devourer because you give. He's already rebuked the devourer. There is no more devourer in your life that is messing with your finances other than your own stinginess, <laughs> your own trust in carnality, but God is your provider. Father, I just thank you that you're increasing generosity in the hearts of every single person in this place. Every single person in this place, Father, watching online, listening, yielding to your spirit to be a blessing. Just say that. I want to be a blessing. I want to be used by God to be a blessing. I will not limit God with my doubt. I will not limit God with my unbelief. I will be generous with my time, with my emotions, with my resources, and with my finances. I am generous and I'm a blessing. God is blessing me to be a blessing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, and if you're in the room and you don't know Jesus, you've never said yes to him again, Make your way down to one of these guys. They'll walk you through that process. If you're watching online and you've never made a commitment to the Lord, you've never embraced Him, you can go to our website, forward.church. We've got a link down at the bottom. It'll walk you through that process. And then reach out to us and communicate with us. Amen. Do you have something that you're taking with you today? And hold, and hold on to it. Build your life on the Word of God and... Don't suffer the things that God doesn't want you to suffer. Be willing to fight the fight of faith. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you. He's for you. He will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church slash give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? Then visit forward.church slash connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube.
you are invited to join our Facebook group where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit Forward Taught Church and click online community under the ministries tab or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.